Okay, I think this mic is on here. So I want to thank Kathleen and Paul for agreeing to chair the meeting. It is an easy ask when uh, you have Hawaii on the menu. So, uh, but thank you for your service in, in organizing this meeting. So it's my pleasure to uh, introduce the, uh, today's um, uh, plenary speaker as part of this effort that we're having at this meeting um, to make sure we're doing everything we can to enhance the diversity of our organization and our science and to be sure that we are um, making a warm and welcoming environment for everyone who needs to be doing aquatic sciences and desires to do aquatic sciences. And so that's what uh, this morning's plenary is about. But I want to just talk a little bit about ASLO and how we've been doing with respect uh, to diversity. So if you um, go to the ASLO website or Google around a bit, you'll find the uh, mission statement for ASLO. And as you can see here, um, one of the leading properties of ASLO mission is that it fosters a diverse community in, uh, in the aquatic, aquatic sciences. And we welcome and invite anyone who's interested um, to join and be a part of our, of our science. And that's just a foundational part of our mission. If you go a little further on our website, you'll find that we have guiding principles. And there they are. And the first guiding principle of ASLO is that we are welcoming. And that is we see, and we are seeking to improve the um, recruitment and retention of diverse scientists at all levels um, of our science. And so, um, so these are right up in front of what we're trying to do as a society to uh, maximize the talent and discovery that goes on in the world of limnology and oceanography. So with respect to gender diversity, which is sort of the issue of, uh, we're focusing on in this plenary this morning and other activities that we'll talk about, I think we're doing pretty well. So I compiled some information about the gender distribution of different parts of ASLO. And here's the composition of our associate editors across all of our journals and our current uh, editorial staff. So uh, I think that that looks pretty good. Um, the board of directors currently is, is uh, female dominated and actually the last five years this has also been true. So we have good gen we've had been getting good gender diversity on our governing board. So I'm uh, pleased to say to point that out. Um, at the presidential level, since 1994, um, there's the distribution. A little bit male biased, but it feels pretty good um, back to 1995. But then if you take a little bit of a deeper look, <laughs> apparently. That wasn't quite the concept before 1994. Come on. That's, yeah, anyway, so um, I'm happy to say that we're doing better more recently, but we obviously um, missed the boat for a very long time um, in the society, and that was to our detriment, unfortunately. But in any case, um, that looks uh, pretty good um, in recent years, at least, at the presidential level. At the level of uh, membership, so we have a good trend going on in membership, and we can sort of extrapolate out into the future, and we can see 2019, maybe 2020, we'll have gender equity within ASLO. So the membership lines are going to cross soon. Um, maybe we can accelerate that somehow. I don't know, but, um, but there's certainly a very steady trend of increasing uh, female uh, involvement in our society. So that's really, really uh, encouraging as well. Ah, everything is great with gender diversity in the aquatic sciences. Well, that's maybe an easy thing for a guy to say uh, up here. But maybe if you're a, a woman in our field, maybe you don't always feel that way. And so that's one of the things that we're trying to address with this uh, plenary session today and other activities. And so luckily, we have some very powerful voices which have come on the scene to point out issues. Many of you know Hope Jaren's work. She used to be at the University of Hawaii. Uh, but the, but the uh, article that really got me riled up about a year and a half ago was this paper, this article in the Washington Post by Julia O'Hearn, who was reporting some very uh, upsetting and, and terrible uh, experiences that she had shipboard um, doing her oceanography work. And that sort of set me off. Um, and um, to think, uh, to be sort of upset about this whole situation and why some of our, um, of our colleagues have to experience these kind of things in their professional um, sphere. And um, so I got kind of mad. And then I read this blog, and, and this author wrote, it's not my job as a junior female academic to figure out how to fix this. I want to see department chairs, society presidents, editors in chief, deans, and university chancellors deal with it. And then it occurred to me, hey, I'm the director of a field station. I could do something. 
So I did something. So we have a code of conduct for the uh, Flathead Lake Biological Station, of which I'm the director now, that all of our uh, staff will be signing, and all of our visitors and students and instructors and meeting attendees will be signing their code of contact just to make sure they're aware of what conduct is expected and what the sanctions will be if they're not met. Um, so that was good. And then I realized, hey, I'm a society president. <laughs> I can do something. This is one of the good things about sort of getting along in your career. You start forgetting a lot of things, of course, right? And including I lost my name tag again already, uh, for example. But um, when you get further along in your career, you get in a position where you can make, really make an impact. And so this is a great thing about getting further along in your career. I'm a society president. I can do something about this. And so that's what inspired today's events, the presidential plenary session, the idea of advancing a vision of a safe and welcoming environment for all in the aquatic uh, field sciences. And especially our field of limnology and oceanography often sets the stage for, um, some re for various reasons, um, these kind of uh, terrible uh, behaviors to occur. And so we're doing something about this. The, this past weekend, the board of directors um, has been discussing uh, uh, a official statement on sexual harassment at field sites and on research vessels that we'll be um, honing a little bit and, uh, and releasing shortly. And this will, we will include sanctions against any of those who are documented to be involved in such activity um, from the society level. Um, so that's uh, coming soon. So you should look up for that to be released um, in the next month or so. And then, of course, our scientific meetings also be, can be an occasion for inappropriate behavior. And so uh, we are also going to be finishing a statement on a code of conduct for our meetings, and this will be distributed with all of our uh, materials and be on the website. And whenever anyone registers for a meeting, they'll be reminded um, about what is expected to make sure that we have a great, wonderful, welcoming environment for all scientific minds at our, at our meetings. So that's what uh, we've been doing. The other thing that's going on at this uh, session associated with this plenary today is that we have a session later today on bystander intervention um, run by a professional uh, in this field. And so if you want to know how to be empowered to make your environment um, safer for all of those around you um, and welcoming for all of those around you how to get uh, something done if something happens, this will help uh, give you the, the tools that you need to make um, your own uh, workspace uh, a better place for those, for everyone. So that leads us to the uh, other part, the most important part of what we're doing today is that is today's plenary uh, speaker. So I'm very pleased in, to introduce Dr. Marsha McNutt. It's also extremely intimidating, I must say, <laughs> to introduce Marsha McNutt. Uh, she's a big science hero. She's one of us. Um, and uh, so it's wonderful that she was able to come to share her um, uh, perspectives on these issues today. So you can see all these things that she's done. She's been president of the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, member of the National Academy of Sciences, director of the USGS, editor-in-chief of science. That's what I'm talking about. It's very intimidating. And now the first female president of the National Academy of Sciences. And so um, it's uh, my uh, deep pleasure to welcome Dr. Marsha McNutt to give our plenary today. Thank you. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you very much, Jim. And good morning, Aslo. It's a pleasure <laughs> to be here. Uh, I was uh, really uh, thrilled to be invited to uh, address you all on a matter that is very near and dear to my heart in terms of trying to find solutions to the issue. Uh, if I could have the first slide, please. Um, I have to say this um, issue of creating a welcoming environment for women, particularly in the field sciences, is one that has gone from uh, perhaps a, a snail's pace to warp speed in a relatively short period of time because um, prior to the um, Jeff Marcy uh, affair at uh, Berkeley, that was broken by BuzzFeed. Um, I don't remember this being an issue that was basically on everyone's agenda in academia. And really thanks to the people at uh, BuzzFeed who uh, broke this uh, matter and brought to the attention of the fact that um, how uh, academic administrators were basically um, sweeping these matters under the rug. Um, this uh, issue is now uh, front and center 
and um, people really are um, taking, taking this matter seriously. And um, as a sort of cascading consequence, many other issues have come to light, and I'll talk a little bit about this here. So um, the title of my talk today is Welcome in the Field, Welcome in Our Field, um, Attracting the Best and Brightest. If women don't feel safe doing field science, how can they possibly consider oceanography um, and limnology um, a possible career choice for them? And I remember I was doing um, uh, an interview for, uh, a, with a journalist, and uh, she was talking about, um, uh, I forget how the topic came up, but she was uh, saying something about, um, I think she was a, a young person, maybe in, um, still in a university, and uh, it was for her uh, university newspaper, and she was talking about um, her possible choices for graduate school, and I said, well, you know, I loved being an oceanographer, and she said something about, oh, I would never consider um, doing something in the field sciences because of all the sexual harassment, and I thought, whoa, this is really scary that the word on the street among young women is that they have to avoid our field because they're concerned about becoming victimized. So, so hence the title uh, for my talk. So um, the questions I, I want to address in uh, my talk today is, how frequently do women in scientific fields, particularly um, in the ocean sciences, encounter harassment? What are the effects of harassment on their career choices? And how do we reduce and eliminate harassment in classrooms, labs, and field settings, including uh, research vessels? So in other words, what is the problem? What is the impact of the problem? And then what are solutions to the problem? So um, this is um, uh, just a, a visual um, representation from the Clancy et al. article that was um, up on uh, your website, so you can all pull it up. Um, but it basically shows the results of a survey um, that was reported in 2014, so it's re fairly recent. Um, you can see more women than men were surveyed, but two-thirds of those who were surveyed experienced harassment uh, in the field. 20% uh, of those who uh, were surveyed uh, reported that it was sexual harassment, and 90% um, of those who were sexually harassed were trainees when they were uh, sexually harassed. And for the women, the perpetrator of that harassment was their superior. So that is very troubling. And you can see that if you go over to the right in the diagram, um, for the women, um, that um, very few of them were um, aware of, if you look at the many who experienced sexual harassment, very few of them were aware of a mechanism to report the fact that they had been harassed. There are many more dots in the third box from the left than the fourth box from the left. And um, once they found a way to report the contact, very few of them were satisfied with the result of their complaint. So the point of this is the victims actually felt victimized twice. Once when they were harassed and a second time when their complaint went basically nowhere. Their perpetrator was either not punished or got a slight slap on the wrist or whatever, and so they still either had to deal with their harasser or um, uh, encounter that person every day or whatever. So in terms of harassment in academia, it's real. It happens. Um, surveys show it. Uh, in an AAU survey, the American um, uh, the, uh, Association of Universities, I think it stands for, um, a survey of 27 institutions found that 62% of undergraduates 
and 51% of graduate female student respondents reported experiencing sexual harassment. For undergraduates, the harassment was most likely to be a peer, but for graduate students, the harasser was more likely to be a faculty member. And the routes for redress were largely unknown, just like we saw on the previous slide, and the routes for redress were largely not effective. So those are two problems that, three problems that need to be solved. Stopping the harassment in the first place, making routes for um, redressing the problem known, and making them effective. Three problems right there in that survey. Okay, so how about the ocean sciences in particular? Um, hard data um, is, is not real recent, but it does come from the study that uh, Jim Yoder and Paula Rizzoli did um, at Hui on improving the gender climate um, at sea. And this is uh, a study that they did back in 2006, and the PDF is available um, on the web. They found that 30 of 60 Hui Joint Program students described unwanted sexual advances, but very few of those were reported. And um, so this 50% uh, rate is very consistent with the 50% rate of graduate students that was seen in the more recent AAU survey. Um, and um, the leaky pipeline um, seems to contribute to the problem. And I show the leaky pipeline down here with current um, numbers. Um, that in the ocean sciences right now, we've got almost gender equity in terms of the students in the field. It's about 50%. And then when we go up to the postdocs, it's a little bit less. Assistant professors, a little bit less. Associate professors, even less. Full professors, very much less. So what you see in this just to put this very crudely, is over at the left hand of that diagram, we've got a target-rich environment, but on the right-hand side, very few senior women there to supervise and make sure these um, women um, are safe in the field and not falling victim. So um, we've got sort of this perfect storm for all these young women coming into the field and very few women uh, in senior leadership positions um, to help make sure that, that their situation is uh, safe. So why does science have a special problem? Some people have asked, does science have a special problem or is this just something that is common in um, business or banking or law or any other thing? Well, I think science does have a special problem, and let me tell you why. Women are underrepresented, especially as PIs. Now, they're underrepresented in other fields too, but, but very underrepresented uh, in science. But even more important, we still have this indentured servant model, for want of a better term, in science. So, um, uh, in that indentured servant model, students come in and they are absolutely dependent on their advisor. They're dependent on their advisor for their funding, for their space in the lab, for their uh, topic for their study, to uh, defend their thesis, and they have very few options to go somewhere else. And so that is very different than um, in, in other uh, fields. And um, they are third, frequently away from the normal nine to five, which isn't true in banking and in business and things like that. So that puts them out of their normal comfort zone, um, which uh, leads to sort of um, different uh, situations that um, where they're away from their spouses or their roommates or other things like that. And the students are dependent long term on those more senior mentors. They shape their career advancement for a very, very long period of time, which is not necessarily true in other fields. And um, finally, complaints, investigations, and outcomes are kept confidential 
by universities. And that is uh, another factor which makes it very difficult. I, I talked about um, BuzzFeed and their um, revelations about Berkeley and how in um, so many cases these um, university universities kept these um, matters so confidential that it was possible for even serial offenders um, to um, not be um, uh, exposed. And in fact, universities would get them to leave and they would go to other universities where they would become serial offenders. So, um, you know, the, the situation is very bad because of these um, uh, confidential uh, investigations. Then there's the research vessel setting. It's isolated, so if you've got a problem with someone, there's no place to go, you can't really get away, um, and it's unreal. As I was writing this, the phrase that came to me was, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. This is kind of the problem you have that I think many of these um, uh, situations, people feel like, oh, I'm out on the research vessel. I'm, you know, out in this unreal setting and this isn't real life and what happens here stays here and it doesn't, this isn't, um, th this isn't um, uh, my real life and this is kind of a fantasy land. No, it's not. What's happening here really affects this career of this young woman, and you can't do that. This is real life. And women are, are frequently outnumbered. If you include the crew and the techs, um, even if there are um, now more and more women going to sea, you know, in my early days as an oceanographer, I was often the only woman on the ship. And that is, um, uh, you know, a, a, a very um, unnerving situation. Um, sometimes women don't have uh, cabin mates because there are uneven numbers. Um, and normal uh, recourses for reporting um, are not available, though I'll talk about how that's uh, changing. Um, complaining jeopardizes um, the funding situation. Um, now for a woman, she might, if she complains, she might find that her funding is, is being pulled. And being viewed as a victim can impact uh, your career prospects. Some women are afraid that they will be labeled as a troublemaker. And that's why they're concerned about making waves. Okay, and let's, let's go on next to whether um, this problem has real consequences. Um, this is one example I wanted to bring up. Um, this one um, was reported in Science Magazine when I was editor-in-chief there. It, um, uh, it uh, was a suspension that happened at Caltech of a professor for uh, harassment. The professor was uh, Christian Ott. He's um, a major player in the LIGO uh, experiment. And um, the uh, sort of... Um, uh, the, the sound bite that went with it was that he fired a student because he fell in love with her. So he didn't want her around anymore because um, he couldn't keep his feelings for her uh, separate from um, the, the work they were doing. Well, this created such an uproar that um, uh, Caltech suspended him uh, Caltech in, invited the student, Sarah Gossen, uh, back um, to Caltech where she was a LIGO research group co-chair. Um, but um, Sarah, in a series of tweets that she put out um, uh, early in, in 2016, said that she was uh, leaving Caltech, leaving physics, leaving the field because of um, retaliation and harassment that she felt um, because of fallout from the entire case between herself and um, Professor Ott. Um, now, I understand that Sarah still is at Caltech, so hopefully there was enough intervention brought in and she felt enough support to be able to stay at Caltech. But it's not easy 
to be the victim of harassment um, in uh, such a high profile case. So um, this is a, a clear case of, uh, of someone who um, herself did no wrong, but um, her career has definitely um, not been uh, an easy road. Um, and uh, Jim already talked about this case, Julia O'Hearn's case. And here's a quote from her Washington Post article. As a graduate student, I was elated when senior scientists invited me to conduct research aboard the same science research vessel Christian, christened by Sylvia Earle, a female pioneer of marine biology. I loved the job despite another colleague's increasingly crude comments about my body, all of which seemed benign, until he came into my room one night while I was sleeping and groped me. When I complained, my shifts were cut. When I asked while my job duties were being altered, I was barred from attending dive school and harassed further. But I kept doing my job. I wanted to be as tough as any Gulf Coast sailor out there. If you haven't read Julia's account in the post, I really urge you all to pull it up and read it. I found her description of what she faced trying to um, uh, pursue her career as a mariner to be absolutely chilling because all of the normal courses, uh, or all the normal um, paths of recourse uh, that were, would, you would think should be open to her, failed her and actually tried to do everything to make her fail. And I think that is absolutely, um, absolutely inexcusable. Absolutely inexcusable. Now, she, and, and, and it led me to ask this question. Are we selecting for the best and brightest, or are we selecting for the toughest and most determined? And is that actually what has happened in our science? That the senior women we see today are actually those who just wouldn't give up. And it brings to mind uh, an experience that I had uh, years ago. I was at a meeting at the National Science Foundation that was a whole group of women who had just spent a sabbatical year that was supported by NSF um, under their um, uh, program in which they had chosen senior women from a number of um, geoscience institutions and um, put them in geoscience departments for a sabbatical year that had no women. And the purpose of this program was to try to show these departments that had no women that it actually wasn't so scary to have a woman in your department and um, to try to um, also provide female mentorship for the many women graduate students that these departments did have. And at the end of the sabbatical years for all these uh, women who had been sort of um, stirred up and sent around to these other departments, we were all meeting at NSF to talk about our experiences. And in fact, it wasn't just geoscience, I think it was NSF-wide, um, all uh, fields. And um, there were about 40 of us there. And um, we were all talking about our experiences and who we were and stuff like that. And after everyone had gone around the room talking about their experiences, I was noticing some kind of trend as people were talking. So I said, excuse me, can I ask everyone one question, or two questions? I said, how many of you are products of single sex institutions as you were being educated? And how many of those institutions still exist? And as we went around the room, the majority of the women that had participated in this program had either gone to all girls schools um, uh, up through or, or at least in high school or had gone to women's colleges. And most of those schools no longer existed as single sex institutions. And I thought what was interesting about this is something that 
had allowed all these women at this time, which was in the um, early 90s, to make it to the top levels of science was that for some time in their development as scientists, they had been in an environment that had been very supportive of women in science. And what I was also concerned about was those environments were rapidly going away. So I think we have to worry about making sure that as those environments that generated the leaders of my generation, how we make sure that we still have environments that generate the leaders of future generations. So let's talk about what's going on today, and I think there are a lot of really good things that are happening. First of all, Jim talked about what disciplinary societies can do, and I wanna give a shout out to the American Geophysical Union. Um, AGU and also AAAS have done a lot of really good things. Um, they've got scientific sessions on harassment at their last annual meeting. They had some really good ones. Some of you might have been there. Um, they've had articles in EOS on it. They have clear anti-harassment policies for meetings and other activities. And I was very happy to hear Jim say that ASLO's developing the, the same uh, sorts of policies that just need um, um, clearance and approval. Um, they have a new Stop Harassment resource website, which is listed here, um, which um, is available for anyone to look at. It emphasizes AGU's commitment to stop harassment. It defines what harassment is. It explains your rights as a victim, and it provides a place to report harassment, so you know where to go to report it. And it, um, AGU is drafting a set of organizing principles for draft for addressing harassment in collaboration with other societies. So AGU is also providing leadership to other scientific societies to help them also get principles um, and um, uh, tools um, for um, uh, combating harassment. So I, I think this is um, a really uh, good step. UNILS um, is also uh, really stepping up to the plate and um, a lot of this just really since uh, early 2016 when all of this um, uh, activity started. Um, this is the UNILS website um, that is devoted to uh, improving uh, gender climate at sea. And um, some of UNILS actions are they've updated their policies on harassment They've got resources on their website, and they put out a training video to all UNILS institutions, and that training video um, is to be used for all shipboard personnel. And you understand that the UNILS, um, there are, of the UNILS ships, there are many non-UNILS institution personnel who actually go out on those ships, so it's important that that training video get to people who aren't even part of um, UNIL's uh, institutions. So um, that's uh, a, a good step. Um, of course, I think ultimately um, solutions have to happen at the institutional level, and that's why I was also happy to see Jim step up and say, hey, I'm a lab director. You know, I have power because I've got people who report to me, and therefore they have to do what I say. You know, that, yes, right, you are. Um, so, adopt a zero tolerance policy. That's number one. And Jim showed you what his policy is. Everyone has to sign it. After they've signed it, if they don't abide by it, you've got something in writing that you put under their nose and you say, hey, you signed this. You aren't living up to it. Now I've got something I can enforce. Yes. Um, requiring training for all staff plus training for um, special facilities such as ships and other things that you might have where it's not actually your staff on it. It's really hard to, um, you know, when people don't work for you, but if they are using your facility, then at least you can um, uh, put requirements on them for using your facility. Um, so that, um, as I say, including outside users. Um, 
be transparent about sanctions against proven offenders. And that's why I say kicking the can down the road. You know, if, if someone's a problem in your institution, to just quietly say, we don't want to go through all the hassle of having to fire you. So if you'll just quietly resign, and we won't say anything, and then they go and get hired somewhere else, and they become a problem there, you really aren't doing anyone any favors. And this is what has happened far too many times. Um, and, um, and the other two problems I said is that people don't know where to go, and when they make a complaint, nothing happens. So you have to provide clear confidential routes for complaints, and you have to protect the whistleblowers by making sure that things happen and there's not retaliation and there's not negative um, consequences. And then we have to find ways to empower and promote women. So, um, you know, people ask me, well, um, you seem to kind of, you know, sail through your career without, you know, people um, putting you down and thinking that you couldn't do things. And, you know, what was, what, what was your secret? And, you know, I think back and one seminal thing that happened to me early in my career was my first summer as a graduate student. Um, my advisor uh, was um, his specialty, my first advisor at Scripps, his um, specialty was um, marine refraction. And Scripps um, was very low. They, they had um, lost some of the marine techs who um, were able to, uh, who had um, licenses for detonating uh, explosions to do marine refraction work. So my first summer at Scripps, he sent me to um, the Navy SEAL team training at Coronado and San Clemente Island um, to spend six weeks training with the SEAL teams, um, which was the fastest way to get a California explosive license that would allow you to legally um, set off uh, major charges. So after that six weeks, when I got back to Scripps, it was well known that not only had I passed SEAL team training, I was first in my class. And no one messed with me after that. <laughs> so that was one way to empower women. OK, so as I said, one, um, one issue is finding, making sure that women know that there are routes um, for uh, complaints. Now, this is just some material that Scripps sent me. They now have um, a harassment prevention and response guide, and Woods Hole has similar materials too. I'm sure many other oceanographic institutions do. Um, this is just the Scripps one. It's important that this guide be available not only to people who might be harassed, but also to the people that they need to respond on their behalf. And so this guide is available at all facilities, on the ships, et cetera, and, um, and it's also posted in public areas like in the mess hall, in the library, et cetera. So um, everyone knows that there are routes to take and how to do it. And this just sort of shows a flow chart um, for the Scripps vessels for complaint resolution. There's one for um, the scientists on the left, one for uh, people who are on the, um, uh, either the crew or the technical staff. And what you see is important in this is there are several routes to take. So that, for example, if you're a um, student or a scientist, and the harasser happens to be the chief scientist, you don't want your only route to be through the chief scientist. I mean, that would be, ugh, gosh, where do I go? So you see that there are several routes to make complaints, and uh, it shows um, uh, how uh, information is shared and how um, resolutions are done. And um, it shows that there actually has to be um, an investigation. OK, um, now, it's, it's not as though these problems are completely solved. Um, the um, uh, folks at Woods Hole said um, they're still dealing with um, uh, 
quite a few issues in terms of um, uh, harassment on vessels. For example, let's suppose the offender is not someone who's a Woods Hole um, employee. And that's quite common because many of the people who sail on Woods Hole vessels are not Woods Hole staff members um, or scientists. So what do they do? Um, would they share the information with the employing institution? Um, would they, if it was a really serious situation, should they involve law enforcement? Um, would they ban the person from future expeditions on that ship, on all Woods Hole ships, on all Unal ships? Um, so they're, they're kind of struggling with how does Woods Hole actually respond when it's not a Woods Hole person? And what is their, what's the limit of their authority in situations like that? And you can imagine all of these might be possible responses depending on the severity of the infraction. So these are, are sorts of things that, that still need to be um, addressed and maybe defined um, as uh, going forward. Okay, um, I also uh, didn't want to leave this um, uh, talk without um, talking about personal action. You know, I've talked about how um, societies can respond, how institutions respond, how um, uh, organizations such as UNOS can respond, but I wanted to give you a story that I thought was very compelling about an individual action. And this is another uh, one that, that we published in Science Magazine when I was editor-in-chief. And it has to do with sexual misconduct in anthropology. And it has to do with Brian Richmond, who's in the upper right. And um, he was working at the um, American Museum of Natural History at the time. And he was accused of uh, sexual misconduct by um, a young woman who was reporting to him at the uh, institution. And she, she actually went public at a meeting in um, St. Louis um, uh, saying, you know, this guy's a bad apple. He um, took advantage of me. Um, I complained to the institution. Um, they didn't do anything about it. I still have to... Um, see him every day. Um, I'm not happy about it. And Brian Wood, in the lower right, was a senior, very influential um, leader in anthropology at, um, he's at, uh, I think, Washington University at St. Louis, or maybe, uh, yeah, I think that's where he is. Anyway, he wasn't even he wasn't even at Richmond's institution. Um, he, he had um, really no control over him. But what Woods knew is that he reviews Richmond's proposals. He reviews his papers. He had recommended Richmond for the position as the human origins curator at that position. He felt responsible for the fact that Richmond was in such a leadership position. So Wood started doing his own investigation. And he started asking around to people. He said, these complaints about Richmond, does this surprise you? And the more people he started asking, the more people started saying, no, it doesn't surprise me at all. And the more he started digging, the more he found people coming forward saying, yeah, this guy is bad news. And he found a um, field camp in Kenya where there were a whole bunch of undergraduate women who had been victimized by Richmond year after year and had complained about it, but it had all been swept under the rug. And so Wood got Richmond barred from the field camp and he actually was willing to talk to Science Magazine about it. And because of that, the whole Richmond um, uh, situation escalated and um, his, uh, his actions were no longer being swept under the rug. So this shows that the action of a senior person 
who actually had been enabling this person's career can actually um, uh, help um, bring matters to light um, as well. Um, now, so what is the National Academies doing about this? Well, um, the National Academies has um, our Committee on Women in Science, Engineering, and Medicine, and we are now undertaking an 18-month consensus study on this. And our statement of task is to review the research on the extent to which women in um, uh, field, fields of science, engineering, medicine are victimized by sexual harassment um, in labs and field sites uh, in other areas. We're going to examine information on the extent to which um, it negatively impact, impacts the recruitment, retention, and advancement of women um, uh, with comparative evidence drawn from other sectors um, so it, we can compare uh, with other areas other than academia. And we're going to identify and analyze policy strategies and practices that um, might be effective in addressing sexual harassment in these settings. So. Um, oops. Um, looking at um, institution, oh, but this is back to the institutional solutions. The one thing that I think we need to really worry about is um, protecting whistleblowers. I think we, this is one area where um, I'm at a loss because to too many of these um, cases that are coming up, this is one thing we haven't addressed. So I'm seeking here your advice. What information, data, or ideas do you have that I can take back to this study committee? In your experience, what works in effectively combating sexual harassment in our discipline? And are there institutional policies and practices at your institution that seem to be effective in creating a more supportive climate for female students and faculty in reducing sexual harassment, in retaining women, in attracting the best and brightest? Tough and determined is fine as well, but we also want the best and brightest. So thank you very much, and I just want to give some acknowledgments to the many people who helped with evidence for this talk. So thanks. And I'm sorry we don't have time for questions. I rambled on way too long. But, uh, but I'm sure you could uh, come, come up and talk to Marcia, uh, if you like. Uh, in about 10 minutes, we'll be starting our first oral presentations. That will run from 10 to 11. And then at 11, we have a combined coffee break and poster session in the exhibit room. Have a good day.